Review. There is much at stake on November 6th if the Democrats succeed. Watch. They'll take away your tax cuts. They'll put rules, regulations. You'll start losing jobs. You're gonna. You would. This would be a terrible thing for the country if that happened. Would it be? More on these polls and much more of my exclusive interview, plus reaction from former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski. And there's this. The New York Times now allowing a Yale professor to use the gray lady platform to compare President Trump to one of the most heinous, one of the most horrible people in all of history, Adolf Hitler. Coming up, my intel on how pathetic, how disrespectful, how disgusting it is, really, in the face of history to make such an allegation. We have more on that. Plus, a caravan packed with 4,000 migrants is hiding, heading rather to the border at this very minute. This is a brand new report obtained by the Washington Post. Shows a record number of families are crossing our border illegally. So why are they coming right now? Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs is here. But first, let's get back to these polls. President Trump's approval rating up three points over last month, the rating just one point shy of his record high. So does this translate into a red wave? Forget the blue wave? Former Trump 2016 campaign manager Corey Lewandowski, he joins us right now from Manchester, New Hampshire. It's good to see you, Corey. It's good to see you. And you know why he's up so high? It's because of your interview last night, Trish. That's why he has the best numbers. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that interview got a lot of play. And we made a lot of headlines, and he had some very interesting things to share, some of which we'll uh, show the viewer tonight. But, you know, he, he made the point, Corey, that the economy's doing well and that there's much at stake. Because if he does not succeed in that if the Republicans do not win Congress this time around, well, you know, it may mean higher taxes for everybody, et cetera. What do you think is at stake for the country economically if the conservatives don't win this one? Well, first and foremost, the Democrats are running on a platform of dismantling the men and women who serve in uniform under ICE. And that means open borders. That means not securing our border. And Ronald Reagan said it best. We can't be a nation if we don't have a border. And the, re the Democrats are running on the platform of dismantling ICE and allowing more immigrants illegally to come into the country. That's the first thing, which should be gravely concerning to anybody for any country. But from an economic perspective, this president made a campaign pledge, and what he said was, for every one new government regulation, I'm going to get rid of two. Well, he didn't fulfill that campaign pledge, because what he did was, for every one new government regulation, he got rid of 22, which is tens of billions of dollars of burden on small businesses removed so they have the confidence to grow and expand. Then he passed the most historic tax cut in our nation's history, and it's just the beginning, because they're looking now at the next tax cut. But if the Democrats take over, that means Maxine Waters becomes the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Jerry Nadler becomes the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Adam Schiff becomes the chairman of the Intelligence Committee. And they will use those bully pulpits to stop the present and stop economic prosperity for the American people for the next two years. So that's what's at stake as people go to the ballot box in 20 days. Do people understand that? I mean, do you really feel like you're going to get... Uh, the kind of momentum you need in terms of getting people out to vote. I mean, things are good, right? The economy's good. They got Judge Kavanaugh there. So that means, you know, the court's locked up. So what is it that's going to cause conservative voters to go to those polls? Well, honestly, I worry about complacency. Look, the last two years have been historic in our nation. We've returned economic prosperity to the middle class and to businesses. We've rewarded the men and women who wear uniforms by giving them the tools they need and the pay raises they deserve. Mm -hmm. We've made uh, America the greatest country in the world again. We saw the Wall Street Journal just yesterday said for the first time in a decade we're the most prosperous country in, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the world. And that's very important. But what I'm concerned about is that those people who support the Trump agenda don't think that they need to go to the ballot in 20 days to support him. His policies are absolutely on the agenda, and he needs an expanded majority in the U.S. Senate, and we have the opportunity to do that, and he needs to make sure that Republicans retain the House, because if they don't, Speaker Pelosi has said, and she's campaigned on this, they will move to impeach the President of the United States and potentially the impeachment of Justice Kavanaugh for nothing more 
than doing what's right by our country. And that will throw our country into further tur turmoil. Corey, do you think that Justice Kavanaugh and what he went through, that entire ordeal, frankly, that the country went through, I've said over and over again, it was a very, very sad day for America. As we watched testimony for both of them, um, from both of them. But Corey, do you think that that is actually going to motivate some people that might have been on the fence and not caring so much? They saw that, and what is it? What does it equate to in their minds? You know, I think the American people saw just how broken Washington, D.C. is and how partisan it has become. And I think back to the speech that Senator Lindsey Graham made where he said he voted for two Democratic nominees to the Supreme Court because they were, the, they were qualified and they were able to serve in their capacity. And the fact that the Democrats belittled and besmirched and, and uh, really destroyed the Kavanaugh family, not just Brett Kavanaugh, but his entire family. Not and his I was family so name. moved. Forever. The when, when, when he said that his 10-year-old daughter prayed for the woman who accused her father of these things, that tells you the type of man that he is. And I think the American people are very smart. I think they saw that, and they saw the politics of personal destruction, which is what they did to him and his family. And this president stood by him. The Republicans in Congress stood fast. But if the Democrats were in control, they were very clear. They never would have moved him forward. And if the Democrats take control of the House of Representatives, they will do everything possible to obfuscate and to block this president's agenda. And you will see them use their ability of subpoena and other things to drag people up to Congress for hearings on things yeah. which aren't relevant well, only to stop ugly. the administration from being successful. That could get ugly. Look, I mean, if nothing else, Judge Kavanaugh, clearly raised a wonderful little girl. I mean, to think that that's what she said in that moment of such crisis for her family. Stay with me, Corey. Don't go anywhere. I, I want to get to another big story. New reports today that Special Counsel Robert Mueller will present key findings related to the investigation, the Mueller investigation, of course, that uh, that should come forward shortly before midterms. Uh, let's go to Edward Lawrence. He's got more in Washington on that. Hey, Edward. Yeah, Trish, yeah, you know, I'm breaking tonight, too. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein defending the Russia investigation as appropriate and independent, according to an interview with the Wall Street Journal. Now, he adds that the in that interview that the in the end, the public would have confidence in the cases that were brought by the Russia probe because they'll see that they're warranted by the evidence and an appropriate use of resources. Now, the indictments have come in bunches. The last batch were Russian officials, no Americans. Now, Bloomberg is reporting that they've heard talk that the the final report of the Russia probe will come out soon after the midterms. Well, the president eager to see that investigation concluded. So there was no collusion. There was no Russia. Do you think I'd call Russia? I need help in Idaho. Mm -hmm. I need help in Iowa. Oh, let's call Russia. It's a it's a con job, just like so many other con jobs that you've been seeing. It's a total con job. It's a disgrace that they were allowed to do. And Michael Cohen and Paul Manafort have been meeting with special counsel as part of their court deals. The president of Judicial Watch says the Department of Justice has been giving Mueller too much leeway and cover for too long. For everything the DOJ has done in terms of stonewalling information about what uh, uh, Rosen, uh, what Mr. Strzok was up to, about what Bruce Orr was up to, about what Glenn Simpson was up to, it's all designed to protect this Mueller special counsel which is illicitly targeting, in my view, President Trump. Now, the final report could be significant if the Democrats win the House of Representatives and get in charge of some of those committees you had mentioned. Uh, they could have subpoena power and start their own investigations in those committees, which could drag through the presidential election. The voters seem to have a different opinion on than the Democrats on important issues like the Russia probe. Uh, Fox News poll, the new poll you referenced at the beginning, talked about what likely voters in the 2018 congressional elections care about. Now, look at this. Russia, the probe by special counsel Robert Robert Mueller is not even in the top four. You can see the list there. Health care is the number one among voters, thinking about 58 uh, percent. The Mueller probe is actually last on that list at 30 percent of likely voters. Also, not a, uh, it's well behind, in fact, uh, some border security, also even climate change. Trish? <laughs> yeah, climate change is way down there. But it's amazing that the Mueller probe is even lower these days than climate change. Yeah. Thank you so much, Edward. Corey Lewandowski still with me. All right, Corey, I'm asking you, because you were on that campaign, you were running that campaign. Did you collude with any Russians? You know, Trish, it's amazing. Uh, I've said this so many times. We didn't collude with any Russians. We didn't communicate with any Russians that I know of. But anybody who tried to impact the outcome of this election in a legal way should go to jail for the rest of their lives. But what I'm concerned about more than that 
is the role that Rod Rosenstein has had in this. You know, he is the one who signed the FISA warrant. Uh, we have asked, and many people have asked the president to declassify the information in those FISA applications because I think there's enough exculpatory evidence in there. Weren't they going to do that? Wasn't that the plan? Well, look, that should be the plan because there's enough exculpatory evidence in there that I believe clearly demonstrates that this whole thing was a hoax from the beginning. This was a dossier paid for by Fusion GPS and, and Hillary Clinton with Nellie Orr, the number four person at the Justice Department's wife involved, and this went all the way up to Andy McCabe, the deputy director of the FBI, and Jim Comey, and they knew exactly that this whole thing was a farce, but they launched it as a, quote, insurance policy, and there's still been no criminal referral for any of the people involved, and I I'll think that's you, Maybe a shame. that's what the investigation should be. Just exactly that what were be. they Look, doing there should be an investigation. Deep state. Anyway, Corey Lewandowski, thank you. It's good to see you. All right, President Trump, everyone, telling me that women voters are actually one of the reasons that he won the 2016 election. So how is he faring now? And can you believe everything you hear? Because if you believe some of the polls you see out there, women don't like them. Hear what he has to say about that next. You know, a lot of women are effectively the CFOs, right, of their yeah. family. If you look at the poll numbers, they're not, uh, they're not liking you. So... How do you overcome that right now? Well, number one, I had worse poll numbers when I went into the last election, and you saw how well I did with women. With the women, they want security, uh -huh. and they want financial security, too. That was President Trump telling me that he's pretty confident, confident on where he stands right now with women. But, you know, he didn't stop there. He tweeted today, college-educated women want safety, security, and health care protections very much along with financial and economic health for themselves and our country. I supply all of this far better than any Democrat, for decades actually. That's why they will be voting for me, exclamation point. All right, we have a panel right now of female experts, including myself, <laughs> our own Susan Lee like from Fox Business joining me on set, Fox News contributor Jimmy Green, and Trump 2020 campaign advisory board member Madison Jesse Otto. Good to see you all. Jammu, I'm going to you first. Good to be with you. <laughs> it's good to see you. What do you Hi, think Trish. he's missing? Because I know you think he's missing something on this. Tell me. Well, Trish, let me start off by saying, because it's the first time I get to say this, welcome to prime time. <laughs> oh. Hello. Hey. Ladies you. are ruling it, not just <laughs> at the polling place, uh -huh. but also in prime time. Well, I'm delighted well, you're here, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Trish. The, the reality is President Trump lied to you in that interview because he is not doing I know good I can always count on you, Jamu. Okay, women. keep going. <laughs> and the situation is pretty dire. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, women voters have outvoted men since something like 1964. The gender gap has been significantly growing since 1984. Mm -hmm. Women vote more than men. So that's already a problem for Trump. You can't just get away with calling a woman, regardless of what her profession is, a horse face, and then think that you can cover it up with a tweet about health care. Mm -hmm. He is driving the enthusiasm for Democrats, which is actually being driven by women. What we're looking at is something like Hillary won college-educated women by six points. Polling is showing that Democrats are winning those same women now in the midterms by 30 points. This is going to be the key constituency behind Democratic wins if especially we are able to win back the House. And President Trump can't have it both ways. He critiques women harder mm -hmm. than Saudi Arabia. He okay. attacks women. And okay. now he expects them to vote for them. Well, no. Here's what I want to so, so, you know, Jimu, I get, and I'm going to go over to Madison for a second, because I get that the left is playing identity politics. By the way, something I really, really hate. And I'm a woman, right? <sighs> and, and I feel like, you know, there's the ability of all of us, whether you're black, Hispanic, Asian, or female to say, I want the best policies for the country, and you're not necessarily looking at it as a gender or, or as a minority. Um, but that's going to mean a lot of economic success in order for people to get over those hurdles. By the way, something he mentioned to me, he thinks economic prosperity is going to cure some of this identity politics. Madison, is he going to be able to do it in time? Because uh, we're like 20 days away. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, since January 20th, 2017, this is exactly what he's been doing. Fabulous interview with him, by the way. Thank but you. women across this country are happy with one thing, and that's results. They don't really care about what he's saying about Stormy Daniels or anyone else on Twitter. They care about how the president's policies and the Republican Party's policies have directly affected their lives. Women are sick of being insulted with the fact that many people in this country believe that they should be one-issue voters or that we should vote for someone because we're a woman. No, I vote for someone because they're the best candidate for the job and because I think they're going to produce results. The president's been producing results for the past almost two years, and he'll continue to do that. And that's exactly what they'll be thinking about when they vote on November 6th. They're going to want to put in place candidates that they can be sure will support the president's agenda, which they believe is the agenda that they believe in and that they want to see succeed. Susan Lee is here on set with me. Hi, yes. And, you know, one of the things you got to keep in mind, though, is, it, look, the poll numbers they're not always that accurate, right? Because, you know, a <laughs> yes. woman may say, yeah, no, I'm not going to vote for him because she doesn't like the tweets that happened recently. But then when she actually goes into the ballot boxes, it's something different. That's certainly what we learned on election night in 2016. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. In 2016, it was different. And I would have to also say, back in 2016, we've heard this rhetoric before, right? When he criticized Carly Fiorina, we've heard the book on his, yeah. uh, you know, tweeting and taunting before, and it didn't hurt him at the polls in 2016. But this year, just to be careful, and it's a note to be careful because we do to go through the suburbs of Philadelphia to Minnesota to Las Vegas, Northern Virginia. That's soccer mom, college educated territory as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe we could tone it down a little bit just with two weeks to go into All the right. midterms. There's some advice here from Susan Lee. That's kind of tone it down, stay away from the Twitter thing, don't mention Stormy. But, you know, I. He, I think he felt wronged, right, Jamu? I mean, this woman uh, came after him pretty aggressively, uh, and less so her. I mean, Avenetti, right, was part of that because Avenetti came so hard after him and came so hard after Justice Kavanaugh that maybe that was, you know, a, a momentary payback uh, kind of tweet. Oh, I'm sorry, the most powerful person on the planet got his feelings <laughs> hurt and needed to lash out. But you know what? They're right. This is going to be about the issues. And one issue that women are absolutely voting on is health care. And why they are voting on health care is because President Trump and the Republicans are trying to take away the health care rights and benefits that came with the Affordable Care Act. They want to strip away pre-existing conditions. They want to make it harder for people who are in love with the Affordable Care Act. That is a huge problem for President Trump. And yes, they're also saying we want this president to be checked. We want to have Democrats who can check this man who seems to have a problem with his potty mouth, uh, problem holding dictators accountable and also uh -huh. they I asked want about to that, see the bipartisanship I asked and they, about they think Democrats will bring bipartisanship in ways that the Republicans haven't exhibited yeah. at all in the last you two know, years. We're going to play a little bit later in the show, a little teaser here, um, what he said about Helsinki because to me, you know, I was really, I was, you know, full disclosure, I was pretty angry with him because I thought he was going to go out there and squash Putin like a bug, right, on stage. He should have. In front of uh, the international That's what a real platform. man would have done. Well, you know, he had an interesting explanation for it, uh, one that we have not heard before, so I'm going to share that with you later on <laughs> in the show. Jamu, it's good to see you. Thank you. Madison, thank you. Thanks, Susan Judge. Lee, thank you so much. All right, a lot more coming up, everyone. The liberal media ratcheting up their attacks. A New York Times opinion video calling President Trump a fascist, need to stop showing the line pictures there. portraying him as Adolf Hitler. You know, I I'm going to give the New York Times a real reality check on this one. My intel, I'll see you right here next. Hungary's Viktor Orban rewrote the Constitution with the goal of making Hungary great again. A line that sounded great to someone. Did you ever hear this before? Make America great again. Fascists create an overwhelming sense of nostalgia for a past that is racially pure, traditional, and patriarchal. From Mussolini to Hitler to Erdogan, fascist leaders... Okay, and he goes on and on and on. You get the point, right? This is a new New York Times opinion video calling out President Trump, saying he is a fascist. This is a Yale University professor, not of history, by the way, my major, but of philosophy, warning that President Trump is a fascist in the vein of one of the most heinous people in history, Adolf Hitler. Yes, this is the kind of garbage, folks, that they are teaching at Ivy League schools like Yale these days. 
to equate our president with a man that killed millions is pathetic. You know, normally I wouldn't even dream of reporting on this. I wouldn't even tell you about it because it's not even worth acknowledging. But this, folks, is the New York Times. This is the New York Times running this video on its front page of its website. To equate our president, who is growing our economy, creating jobs for all ethnicities, by the way, and trying to really level the playing field for our country and trade, well, you know what? It is a smack, a smack in the face to history. As Professor Alan Dershowitz said to Fox Business, and I quote, to think the president is a Nazi is to deny the Holocaust existed. The media's hatred of this president is, in one word, extraordinary. It's really kind of a blind hate, a hate for a person, and a hate that fails to consider any of the policies. Yeah, the policies, because that actually requires a little bit of intellect. They have to think about what's actually going to affect our economy and our nation, the policies that are creating prosperity for our nation. Meanwhile, I would remind the New York Times, I would remind this Yale professor, and I would remind anyone else that throws around words like fascism and Adolf Hitler, that in a fascist country, well, you know, this professor would never be allowed to release the darn video, right? The New York Times would never have been able to be critical of him. And I, I certainly wouldn't have been able to challenge him like I did here, watch. Helsinki. You know, you, you've got a lot of criticism, including from me, full yeah. disclosure. Uh, you know, I, I wondered why you weren't tougher on Putin, but you've said you had a great meeting, you met with him one on one. Trish, what happened? If I was tough, it's easy for me. It's easier for me to be tough. We had a great meeting with him before that. We had a two hour meeting, and then we had another meeting, I guess, with a lot of people, and they were great meetings. And it was very tough, but they well, were great. Why meetings. were they great? With Putin. They want me to go up and have a boxing match with them on stage. Having a good relationship with Russia would be a good thing, not a bad thing. Did you tell them in that this meeting? This stupid investigation yeah. hurts us from having a good relationship. Don't forget, we're a great nuclear power, but so are they. Okay. And having a good relationship is not a bad thing. Did you tell him in the meeting he's got to knock it off? I told him. You told him, he said. <laughs> no more interfering. But anyway, my point is I challenged him on that. I challenged him on a bunch of other things. We, 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 we got into it. But, you know, you can't actually get into it like that if you don't have a free press, if you're some kind of fascist nation. And by the way, if you listen to this darn professor from Yale, you'd think we were on the brink of a holocaust. I mean, is that not insulting to every person who lost a family member in that horrific moment in history? How dare he go out there and criticize our president and suggest that somehow it's equivalent of a fascist dictator like Hitler? I I'm over that kind of language. Anyway, we invited the professor on our show here. Um, <laughs> needless to say, we have not heard back. I wonder uh, if he'll change his mind at some point. Joining me right now with more on this whole bizarre turn on our mainstream media. We have none other than a former Secret Service agent, Dan Bongino. Dan, right? It's it's sort of wild. I, you I, know, it reminds it reminds me of a scene from that uh, Adam Sandler Billy Madison movie. You know, we're all dumber for having heard that. That, wait, wait, that was, Trish. Well, I think he was from New Hampshire the, in that movie. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the very <laughs> essence of... The, no, no, the, nothing the against New Hampshire, but fascism. I remember that. Billy Madison. Okay, we're all dumber. Yeah. We're all dumber for having heard that because the very <laughs> essence of fascism, as you hinted at in your, in your, in your opening remarks there, is the increased yeah, concentration of government power. So let's just try for a second, because I know you're a reasonable person. Let's try to get some of this reason over to the left. So Trump gives you back some of your money through tax cuts. Mm -hmm. He decreases government power by shrinking the regulatory apparatus. Mm -hmm. And somehow, somehow he's a fascist. Does that even make any sense? I swear, I lost 10 IQ points even listening to that yeah. thing before. Well, then, yeah, yeah, no, me too. I, good thing I didn't this. go to Yale. I went to a much better school, Columbia. Anyway, Dan, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, it's true. <laughs> anyway, but Dan, I mean, you, you listen to this guy and it's very clear that this is the Kool-Aid he's drinking. And by the way, I'll yeah. point out teaching. And, it, you know, it becomes kind of a group think. 
after a while. A and it's easy to point fingers and say, you know, this president is just horrible. We hate him because he's yeah. thinking differently about things like economic prosperity than maybe we have in the past. Yeah, but, but Trish, you know, to make these comparisons, as you mentioned before, these are unique stains in American history. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fascism, I mean, that, well, that German history, but you get the point, we fought in World unique War II. Unique and horrific, Things like, yes. Right, right, these are unique horrors in, 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 in modern times, uh, relatively modern times. When you talk about things like slavery and you talk about things like the, the Holocaust, you don't just randomly throw those comparisons out there. These are unique horrors in human history. For you to compare them to a lost presidential election because you don't believe in what, the repeal of the individual mandate in Obamacare, is as you said before, and you are right, and I'm glad you're highlighting this, is an insult to the people walking around with numbers tattooed on their wrists who survived Nazi death, death camps. This is grotesque behavior. This guy should apologize immediately to all of the people who were sadly a part of that. You know, he's not the only one, though, Dan. I mean, they keep making these no, kind of not. comparisons, and it, it really, um, I, I don't often highlight it because I don't think it's worthy of, but, you know, this is the New York Times, right? And this is the front page of the New York Times. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Well, well, this was considered once, at one point, the authority, the, you know, the old gray lady, the authority for news in America. For them, I agree with you, to put this up, this sad opinion-based commentary that's so far off base. No, I, I, I think you made the right call. I think you have to address this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, listen, I'm a conservative. I'm a partisan. I get it. Um, but, but this is the kind of stuff that we should all agree on. Is that I, I disagree with Barack Obama very loudly. But to make comparisons to the, the Holocaust and things like that, there have to be boundaries, Trish, and this is clearly outside of it. I agree. I agree, Dan. And, uh, and that's why I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention, because this is how crazy it's getting. And it's not just on the fringe, right? I mean, Yale, we're laughing at it, but, you know, Yale educates a lot of people that go on to very great things, right? So, so this is someone who has a, a, a big influence on these young kids. And it's not just that. It's the New York Times, which has, you know, historically been a pretty big deal. And that's on the front page. And by the way, something I did not show you, Dan, and I did not show the viewer out of respect to the president, out of respect to history, and everyone that lost a life there in such a heinous, heinous time in history with the Holocaust, and, and, and just out of respect to all of our viewers. I didn't show you what they put in that video. They showed our president dressed as Adolf Hitler complete with the swastika yeah. and everything. I mean, this is the New York Times and Yale University, so that ought to tell you something. Dan Bongino, good to see you. Good. All right, fresh Fox News polls just revealing immigration is a top issue for voters. All of this as Democrats continue to push for open borders. We have the latest on the battle at the border that's coming up next. Fox News poll released moments ago revealing immigration as one of the very top issues on voters' minds just weeks away from the pivotal midterm elections. And Democrats are continuing to push for open borders and even, even, believe it or not, undocumented voters, as in illegals that are here in this country. I want you to listen. The thing of it is, the blue wave is African American. Yeah. It's white, it's Latino, it's Asian Pacific Islander. Yeah. Yeah. It is disabled. Yeah. It is differently abled. Yeah. It is LGBTQ. Yeah. It is law enforcement. Yeah. It is veterans. Yeah. It is made up of those who've been told that they are not worthy of being here. Yeah. It is comprised of those who are documented and undocumented. Yeah. Really? Undocumented? Is that what they're pushing for now? You want to ask somebody who's here illegally whether or not they should be able to vote? I mean, should I be able to go to Mexico and vote? Because wouldn't that be the equivalent? My next guest is someone who cares very much about immigration because he's struggling with a lot of immigrants right there at his border and a lot of people coming across. Joining me right now, Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs. Congressman, good to have you. Welcome. Good to be with you, Trish. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. As well. Thank you. Yeah. It's good to have you here. So immigration's a big issue. You're certainly yeah. facing, it's probably the number one issue down there in Arizona along the border. What do you think when you hear women like this, uh, this is the gubernatorial nominee, the Democrat in Georgia, campaigning for the idea that uh, we should be able to allow, quote unquote, undocumented people here, as she calls them, to vote? 
Yeah, it leaves me scratching my head. I mean, there's a there's a reason that people want to be citizens of the United States, whether you're born here or whether you want to legally immigrate here. It's, be, it's because we respect the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And it is basically a trouncing of the very notion of American statehood, American citizenry, American law. And basically, it takes us, instead of being an, a, an exceptional country because everyone follows the law, it reduces us. That's what they're ask, asking for. Congressman, Reduce it, us. Yeah, it, it, we're like living in some kind of alternative universe sometimes, I think, because, you know, the Yale University professor uh, pointed out that, it, you know, if you're too nationalistic, if you care too much about your country and your people and your traditions and your culture, then somehow you're on a path to Nazism. And then you have this woman saying, we need not care enough because we just ought to open the borders up and anybody who wants to come can vote for anyone. Yeah, that's right. And and what it is, is it's this idea of this one world order, this dogma Scary, that's been man. taught and indoctrinating so many uh, generations now that that uh, no state should even exist. I mean, you can study that. That's it, the, A lot of the scholarly writings are that way. No states, no borders. And to what end? Some, something's going to I don't know how board. we're going to afford that, by the way. Like if we suddenly said, yeah. okay, yeah, hey, hey, everyone in Mexico, come here. Um, then we're responsible, by the way, economically, for the welfare of everyone in Mexico or everyone in Canada. And, you know, I, I only look to Sweden, and I have a number of friends there, uh, many of whom are very liberal. And even they, Congressman, will tell you, they can't handle the number of migrants that have come in because economically, it, it, the numbers just don't work out. They, they don't have enough money to support all of the people that are then coming in and demanding all this welfare. Before I, I let you go, I do want to ask you about something, because this is Nancy Pelosi, who, by the way, you know, if the Democrats are successful, she's going to be uh, running things there in the House. Here's what she's saying about the whole wall and, and immigration, and somehow I don't know how this happened, but it's apparently become uh, an issue of sexism. Listen, sir. We have to do something other than building a wall with moral, expensive, ineffective, and not something that people do between countries. Um, but in any event, uh, it happens to be like a manhood issue for the president. <laughs> and um, I'm not interested in that. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so I, having a strong border is somehow a manhood issue? I, I don't get it. That's well, I enjoyed the nervous titters there as the people were listening there laughing a little bit. But the reality is, it's not a manhood issue. It's, it's a love of country issue, a love of the rule of law, and it's a, it's a national security issue for Pete's sakes. And uh, Nancy Pelosi, let's just uh, so get our voters out there so she's not the next Speaker of the House, I can tell you that. Oh, you guys have your work cut out for you. you got 20 days to go. Congressman Biggs, it's good <laughs> to see you. Thanks, Trish. All right, nearly six months after the Roseanne revival, The Connors is making its premiere. And you know what? These numbers are way down from Roseanne's opener. The shocking or not so shocking number for you next. Three weeks since Granny Rose's funeral. Why are people still giving us casseroles? And why do people bring casseroles when somebody dies? It's actually a practical gift when people are grieving. They don't want to have to cook. What about when the casseroles run out? What if the person who died is the only one who cooked? Then we keep telling people we're grieving until we figure out how to feed ourselves. The Connors premiering last night, rating much lower than the Roseanne premiere nearly six months earlier. The entire cast is back, well, except for the star, of course, Roseanne Barr, who was fired because of some controversial tweets related to race. So is this ratings drop actually proof that Hollywood is kind of out of touch with middle America? With me right now to discuss, we have media reporter at The Hill. Joe Concha, and we have Fox News contributor Richard Fowler. Good to see you guys. All right, Richard, I'm going to qualify this by just at least pointing out that they, they won the night, right? They did pretty well. They got well over 10 million viewers. But uh, when it premiered with Roseanne, they got 18 plus million viewers. So why the fall off, Joe? Well, remember, let's put it in context. The Roseanne finale, when Roseanne was still with the show, got 10.3 million viewers. So this actually rated higher than that. But overall, Fairly. look. When they got 18.2 million viewers, that set records. I mean, ABC hadn't seen anything like that for four years. I think the challenge here 
honestly, Trish, is can it hold this audience? I mean, 10 million is still very good. As you said, it won the night. It beat This Is Us on NBC, which is a, jug, a ratings juggernaut. Mm -hmm. But I think here there was a curiosity factor more than anything around this, right? Like, what does this thing look like? It reminds me of when I watched Happy Days for the first time, when Richie Cunningham and Ralph Mouth, right, Ron Howard, Donnie Most weren't on that show, or Brenda on 90210 when she was off for the first time. People want to see what that looked like, and they wanted to see how they're going to kill off Roseanne. Usually in these situations where you can't bring the character back physically, it's a plane crash, they get hit by a blimp. In this case, they kill her off by making her an opioid abuser. I, I mean, man, I mean, that's, that's, go, that's rough, right? man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, was that sort of, you wonder, pointed in and of itself? Richard, what did you think? Well, let me say this, and I, I've criticized a lot of my liberal friends for not looking at the Roseanne show and this new Connor show for what it was. Mm -hmm. And the writers here, beyond Roseanne Barr, who her tweets were ridiculous and disgusting. Yes, they were. But if you look like Wanda Sykes and the people in the white writing room, they, under, they understood what was happening in middle America. Yes, they're a white family, but they have a biracial child. Mm -hmm. They have a non-binary a non granddaughter. They're dealing with all these issues that are happening in everyday middle America that I think Hollywood has missed sometimes. This show gets that. The question is, can it maintain 10 million views every week? That's going to be the big star. Right, but but I think Joe is right. If the season finale got 10.3 million, this rated better than the season finale. I think you but know barely. the newness. I mean, like, the, the, like, it's like, it's like I mean. It's yeah. like a new car, Trish. Well, the new smell is worn <laughs> off, and now people like the normal watch. Is like I like my car, and I'm going to continue watching because it deals Let with everyday issues. Issue here. Because Alec Baldwin also had a new show, and it completely bombed out. Uh, I just wonder. I, oh, and then there's Tim Allen, right? Who was on ABC, and they dropped him, and then he came over here to Fox, and he's doing fantastic. So, Joe, is there a bias in Hollywood? And I think we know the answer to this, but I want you to explain it. Is there a bias against? Uh, anyone who's perceived as a conservative and you know, I don't like this by the way I I, I just answered the question for you Joe. I don't like it because <laughs> you know what though the, it does exist and, and the sad thing is that somehow they are always assuming that you're like crazy or you're you know just not intelligent if somehow you have a, a viewpoint where you believe Americans deserve to keep a little bit more of the money that they earn but explain to me the culture Joe in Hollywood. Okay, well, it's very easy to explain. Tim Allen had a show called Last Man Standing on ABC that did very well in the ratings, and somehow it gets canceled. So Fox was smart to pick it up. Alec Baldwin gets a show on ABC. Alec Baldwin, remember, it's a talk show. It's like a sit-down Dick Cavett kind of talk show. He had one of those already. We had precedent. Mm -hmm. 2013, MSNBC, it lasted, I think, five weeks. It got horrible that ratings. Was Alec Baldwin? The format didn't work. <laughs> well, Alec Baldwin had yeah, a show on MSNBC once a week on Fridays, right? But I think here's what Roseanne supporters want to see, Trish, to be honest with you. They want to see John Goodman in a robe walking towards a shower at the end of the season this year. And she, he opens up the shower door, and there's Roseanne. Comes out of the steam, just like Bobby Ewing in season well, nine of right, Dallas. Right, sure, it was all, all a dream. And for Richard. That, you know what? Yeah, they may be watching right now because apparently every time Joe uh, goes on the air and suggests what should happen in Roseanne, it, it comes true. In fact, right after Roseanne left the show and they kicked her out. What was it? Joe, you, you, you told Hannity what? They should name it the Connors. I said they should bring back the whole cast because it's not their <laughs> fault that Roseanne sent out, you know, one of the worst tweets ever. They still got John Goodman. They still got a full cast. It still has great ratings. You get even half that, you'll be fine. Yeah. You should call it the Connors and put it back on in the fall. ABC, I didn't know they're they did. actually listening to me. Yeah. My wife barely listens to me. <laughs> I should get 20% of somebody's cut here, right? For sure, for sure. And now you're giving them more ideas. Richard. You know, I think there's one thing about this show, like I said at the beginning of this, is what this show does, it, it's relatable, because I think this is what's happening in everyday middle America, is people are dealing with real problems, and while they create laughter and comedy to it, they're dealing with real everyday issues. How we make ends meet. How do we deal with a child that has come back home because they've lost their job in a big city? How do we deal with a biracial granddaughter? All things tackled in this show that are really important for a large swath of the country. Yeah. The question is, can they do it without her? Hey, last word to you, Jeff. Last word is very simple. Richard, we're actually agreeing. We always have such civil, civil conversations on here. It's remarkable. But oh, it's why Joe. Fox News and Fox <laughs> Business works, because you're not appealing just to the cultural elites and the bubble of Washington and New York and Los Angeles. There is a whole other country out there that has an appetite for this stuff. I think it was uh, Charles Krauthammer said it once. He said, he said it best. He said, Fox News discovered its niche audience. Half the country and that's why it succeeds Fox that's why too. shows like this will succeed hey joe thank you so much richard thank you it's good to Coming see you up Thanks. more on my interview with the president
Now, this is a very iconic room in the White House. It's actually located right across from the Oval Office. And it was the original site of the President's office before the West Wing was built back in 1902. FDR called that room, you're looking at it right there, the fish room, because he displayed an aquarium and some fishing mementos in there. It wasn't until actually 1969 that President Nixon named the room in honor of both Teddy and Franklin Roosevelt. That's why it's called the Roosevelt Room. Uh, here's a picture of President Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford holding a staff meeting. President Jimmy Carter meeting with the Joint Chief of Staffs. President Bill Clinton holding a meeting in 1993. You know, it is a room that has a ton of history. It is a room that I was uh, fortunate to be in. Very important interview. Good night, everyone. Good to see you. I'll see you tomorrow. Kennedy begins right now. All right, then. Thanks, Trish. Well, the allegations are gruesome. Fingers snipped. Limbs hacked.